afternoon, everyone. Um, so I think it's fair to say that um, everyone fears something, um, whether it's small like spiders, which seems to be a common thing, or, um, or whether it's heights or um, I'm 40 next year. It's quite a scary thing for me. Um, so I think we're quite lucky, though, in this country, aren't we, that um, a lot of the fears that we have are, are common um, and we can look around the world and there are things which obviously the war and disease and famine which um, we're um, not immune to um, but they don't affect us quite as much um, as in other countries um, and a lot of fears they are like the examples I used and um, they're quite personal to us aren't they um, on the other hand we have trust and trust um, it forms an extremely important part of our lives um, it's something to the extent that we don't really think about too much um, Extreme example, we could go skydiving um, and those people jump out of an aeroplane, um, wouldn't do it myself, um, but they trust that when they come to open that parachute that that's going to come out and, and save them um, from um, what we well, don't really want to think about what it save them from. Um, but we also trust in the little things like uh, this time of year, the weather's pretty awful. Um, so we trust that when we go outside with, with, in our coats, um, it's going to keep us dry and warm. Um, and when we came uh, to the hall today, we trusted that when we flick the light switch and um, that the lights are going to come on. So they're things we don't really think about, but we we trust in them. So um, trust is uh, it's important to us, uh, our everyday lives, um, and it can take away worry if we, we know we can trust in something. Um, and if we didn't trust in anything, then obviously yeah, we'd be nervous wrecks and we wouldn't uh, leave our homes. Um, so if we wanted to test those examples that I've given, um, maybe we wouldn't want to test the skydiving, but um, I could go outside um, in the wind and rain in my coat. And if it keeps me warm and dry, I know that I was right to trust it. Um, if I want to trust the lights, well, we know they're on, um, but this morning I could have just flicked the light switch. So how can we um, prove that we can trust the Bible in the same way? Um, well, we, we looked a little bit um, earlier today at some, some science where um, the, the Bible mentioned things which weren't discovered until hundreds, maybe thousands of years um, later. Um, but this afternoon, I want to look at a little bit about the, the accuracy of the, the script itself, um, but also look at some of those um, prophecies that we get within the Bible, which for me personally is um, one of the, the really exciting things about it. So um, the facts, some facts about the Bible. Um, it was completed nearly 2,000 years ago, and uh, it's estimated there's been about 24,000 different handwritten ancient copies or portions of the Bible found. And of the New Testament copies, only 0.2% of that text is in question. Um, and even those parts of um, the Bible that are in question, they're not, they're not teachings, they're just bits of grammar and, and that kind of thing. Um, and so bear in mind, these are handwritten copies. Um, if you ever try to copy something um, verbatim by hand, it's not an easy thing. Um, and they're not printed ones um, like we get mass produced. So um, I think that over 2000 years, that's pretty good going. Um, in comparison, um, there's a, another ancient book called Homer's Iliad. Uh, I don't know if anyone's read it um, or, or even heard of it, um, but it was um, written around 750 BC. Um, and it tells the story of um, the Greek hero Troy, uh, sorry, the, the, the city of Troy and the hero Achilles, um, amongst other things. And um, the ancient copies of the Bible were around 25 times more accurate um, than the ca those handwritten copies of the Iliad to, to give it some kind of context. Um, and Nelson Gluck, um, uh, an archaeologist, also said that it may be stated categorically that no archaeological discovery has ever controverted a Bible reference. Um, so there might be bits that aren't quite uh, haven't been discovered, um, but nothing they've found is controverted and uh, what it says in the Bible. Um, and personally, I think the things become a lot more interesting when we um, actually look at what the Bible says itself. Um, there are loads of prophecies that I could go to uh, this afternoon, those prophecies that have been fulfilled, um, events that uh, have been predicted um, in the Bible when they're written um, and later come true. A lot of these um, are about Jesus um, and uh, they, they uh, became, uh, they fulfilled, became fulfilled um, when he was crucified. 
but some of them have been fulfilled more recently. And we're going to look at the history now of, of three nations. Um, our first nation or city is that of Tyre. Um, again, it's probably not something we've heard, but it's just off the, the coast of, of Israel. Um, and, we, and we first read about Tyre, um, a Phoenician city, in Ezekiel and chapter 26. So if you'll um, please turn there with me. Um, so when I say it's off the coast of Israel, it's more accurately off the coast um, of Lebanon. But um, in Bible times, uh, so around 596 BC, uh, when this prophecy was given, it was, uh, it was the central trading hub of the world, um, the Mediterranean Sea. And um, the, the power of Tyre, it was the, the biggest um, maritime or, or seafaring power at the time. And um, don't need to turn there, but Isaiah 23 describes Tyre as the crowning city whose merchants are princes, who, whose traffickers are the honourable in the earth. And so it, it, Tyre was this proud city. Uh, it had tall walls. Uh, but it was um, opposed to God's people Israel, so they were they were in conflict. And because of this, they were told that a series of things would happen against them. Um, so firstly, if you're in Ezekiel 26, uh, we read in verse 7. Thus saith the Lord God, behold, I will bring upon Tyre Nebuchadrezzar, king of Babylon, a king of kings from the north, with horses and with chariots, and with horsemen and companies and much people. And so this is um, the mighty nation of Babylon. And they were told that the king of Babylon would besiege their city of Tyre. And um, we read um, later that um, years later, the walls of the city were breached. Um, if we look at verse four, uh, we're told that uh, Babylon shall destroy the walls of Tyre and break down her towers. I will also scrape her dust from her and make her like the top of a rock. And so um, this island fortress of Tyre, um, when they saw that the mainland city uh, was breached, um, the inhabitants of Tyre moved all their wealth um, onto their island fortress, um, which was half a mile off the coast. And the, the city on the mainland of, of Lebanon was deserted and uh, later destroyed by um, Nebuchadnezzar and the Babylonians. Um, and however, this isn't the end of the prophecy. Um, we read in verse 12, uh, God tells us that they shall lay thy stones and thy timber and thy dust in the midst of the water. And then verse 14, I will make thee like the top of a rock. Thou shalt be a place to spread nets upon, thou shalt build, shall, sorry, get my words out, and thou shalt be built no more. And then lastly, verse 17, um, it says, they shall take up a lamentation for thee and say to thee, how art thou destroyed that wast inhabited of seafaring men, the renowned city, which was strong in the sea, she and her inhabitants, which caused their terror to be on all that haunt it. And so we're told there that the stones and the timber of the buildings will be put into the sea and uh, fishermen will stand on it and cast their nets. And that um, also they will be and um, they will cease to be this um, this world maritime um, nation um, as they were before. And so these things we've just read about in uh, verses uh, 14, um, 15 and 17, they those things didn't happen at the time of the Babylonians. Um, because in their island fortress, Tyre, uh, they remained a power, they remained a force, and uh, they believed they were impregnable with their strong navy um, and also these tall walls being able to defend the island in which they lived. Um, so is the Bible um, account inaccurate? Um, well, no, it isn't. Because if you look at the change in the language uh, within this chapter, we read in that verse 7, um, that Nebuchadnezzar, um, sorry, Nebuchadnezzar, uh, king of Babylon, was going to be sent against Tyre. Verse 8, um, notice the emphasis, he shall slay with the sword, thy daughters in the field, and he shall make a fort against thee. Um, verse 9, 
uh, we read that he shall set engines of war against thy walls, and with his axes he shall break down thy towers. Um, and it continues in verse 10. His horses, their dust shall cover thee. A bit further down, when he shall enter into thy gates. Verse 11. With the hooves of his horses shall he tread down all thy streets. He shall slay thy people by the sword. But if we look at verse 12, and um, we see that the emphasis changes. Um, we read, and they shall make a spoil of thy riches and make a prey of thy merchandise, and they shall break down thy walls and destroy thy pleasant houses, and they shall lay thy stones and thy timber and thy dust in the midst of the water. Um, and so it changes from very clearly he to they. Um, now, Nebuchadnezzar, Nebuchadnezzar um, king of Babylon, is what we'd call an autocrat. So basically anything he said um, went. If he wanted someone's head to be chopped off, then someone's head would be chopped off. Um, so Nebuchadnezzar had absolute power um, in his kingdom, um, and that he um, represents Nebuchadnezzar and Babylon. They refers to Alexander the Great, who came along um, about 250 years later with his Grecian army. And although um, we know Alexander is this, this great and famous leader of the army, uh, the Grecian system was actually run by democracy. Uh, there wasn't an autocrat like um, the Babylonians. Um, it was, um, they had a, a democracy where um, leaders would um, just debate um, the government, not quite like we have now, not quite as many MPs, um, but it was a, a similar um, kind of system. And it was the Grecians that finished um, this job uh, that God had set to destroy Tyre. So Tyre um, didn't surrender to Alexander's armies because of their strong position. As I said, they, they thought they were impregnable. Um, for the Grecian army to attack uh, the fortress, um, a bridge or a ramp of some kind uh, was needed. So what did Alexander decide to do? Well, he used all of the stones and the timber and, and the dirt from the old city of Tyre on the mainland, and he threw it all into the sea. Um, and he created a causeway um, across the island fortress um, so that he could move his siege towers uh, within the range of the walls of Tyre. Um, and it's just as uh, predicted um, in verse 12 um, of Ezekiel 26, um, that the stones and timber and dust were laid into the ocean. And so with this um, causeway, it's known as Alexander's Causeway, um, Alexander um, conquered um, Tyre. And if you to look, um, look on the maps now, um, over time, this causeway is just built up. So the whole thing uh, just looks like a, um, like a pier or something. <laughs> not very good terminology, but that goes out to the sea. Tyre is no longer an island because of this causeway um, that Alexander built. And so after Alexander's victory, Tyre never recovered, and um, it's never been rebuilt um, in the same way um, to this day. Uh, the navy and the merchant boats, that they were the best around at the time in the Mediterranean, uh, they ceased to exist, as verse 17 predicted. Um, but Tyre, um, it is still a big fishing city, and that prophecy from verse 14 um, also came true, um, as the, the Arab fishermen um, cast their nets into the sea um, from that causeway, or they did before they had boats, obviously. Um, so I, I don't know whether any of them still go go fishing on the, the causeway now, but um, but certainly before the, the mainstream fishing uh, came along, that's what exactly what they did. Um, please come with me to Jeremiah 50, because the, se the second nation I want to look at is actually Babylon themselves, uh, one of those nations that came against Tyre um, and destroyed that main mainland city. And at the time of writing, uh, Babylon was a great city. It ruled most of the known world. And it was a, a great power. Most of the city was full of gold. It was um, a rich nation. And we know, um, or it's believed, uh, that they built, um, Nebuchadnezzar built the Hanging Gardens of Babylon, um, considered to be one of the seven ancient wonders of the world. Um, but where is Babylon now? Well, it doesn't exist. Um, if it did exist, uh, it would be somewhere in Iraq. Um, 
So the nation, sorry, the, I want to say Babylon doesn't exist. The nation of um, the power of Babylon um, doesn't exist. Um, so if we read from Jeremiah chapter 50 and verse 1, um, we read that the word that the Lord spake against Babylon and against the land of the Chaldeans by Jeremiah the prophet. And if we come to verse 39, therefore the wild beasts of the desert with the wild beasts of the islands shall dwell there and the owl shall dwell therein. And it shall be no more inhabited forever, neither shall it be dwelt in from generation to generation. As God overthrew Sodom and Gomorrah and the neighbour cities thereof, saith the Lord, so shall no man abide there, neither shall any son of man dwell therein. And so the Bible says that this great city, the centre of the world empire at the time, would never be inhabited again. Um, and at the time it would have seemed absolutely absolutely ludicrous but thousands of years on um it still hasn't been inhabited um, as a city again um but it isn't because no one's tried um not until um, 1811 was the, the city of babylon actually discovered um and in the 1900s they started to um, excavate it and dig it up and when they started to uh, dust off that the sand from the bricks of the ruined buildings, they found um, the signature of Nebuchadnezzar written on the bricks themselves, and we read of him in, in the book of Daniel. Um, no one since um, it was built by Nebuchadnezzar had tried to rebuild it um, until Saddam Hussein and the dictator who ruled um, Iraq for, for many years. And in 1971, it was announced that the city of Babylon would be completely restored. Um, a, a highway was built from Baghdad, the capital of Iraq, um, and Babylon, sorry, to Babylon, and bricks were made that had both the names of Nebuchadnezzar um, and Saddam Hussein on them. Um, and so it was just to, to copy um, the way that Nebuchadnezzar had built it um, thousands of years before. Um, in 1987, the, the rebuilding of the temples, the palaces and the gardens had come so far that a month's Babylonian festival was um, set to declare to the world that Babylon had been restored to its former glory. However, um, a few years later, um, the Gulf War broke out in 1990, and the Babylon that Saddam Hussein had tried to rebuild was um, destroyed before anyone had the chance to inhabit it. So despite Babylon being such a, a superpower um, thousands of years ago in the times of of Jeremiah um, and other prophets, it's never been inhabited um, as a city um, again to this day. Now, the, the final nation I want to um, consider is, is that of Israel, uh, God's people, if you'll come first with me to Deuteronomy in, in chapter 28. And we read consistently throughout the, the Bible that um, Israel were God's chosen people because of Abraham, um, a faithful man who um, did as the Lord commanded. He was given promises that his descendants, they'd become a, a great nation and that God would bless them. But God also said that if they stopped following him as their God and, and didn't do their commandments, uh, there would be consequences. And we read of this in Deuteronomy chapter 28, uh, if you'll come to verse 64. Um, so the consequences of um, not following God as they should do, um, God tells them, verse 64, that the Lord shall scatter thee among all people from the one end of the earth, even unto the other. And there thou shalt serve other gods, which neither thou, thou nor thy fathers have known, even wood and stone. And so he says that the people would be scattered from one end of the earth to the other. And after Israel left Egypt, uh, they came into their own land, which we uh, would read of in Exodus. And although they did go into captivity periods of time, uh, they went to Babylon and the nation of Israel were, were captive in Babylon for um, 70 years. And they did stay a nation and they stayed mostly in their own land and up until um, the time of uh, Jesus, which we read of in the New Testament. And so when Jesus was on the earth uh, 2,000 years ago, the land of Israel was controlled by the Romans. And 70 years after Jesus was born um, in AD 70, Jerusalem was destroyed by the Romans. Um, and about um, 60 years later, 
after an, an uprising by the Jewish people to fight against the Romans. Um, the, the, dis, the Romans destroyed a lot of uh, the Jewish towns and got rid of the Jewish government. And, and gradually from this point, uh, the Jews scattered all over the world, uh, just as um, Deuteronomy um, said they would. And if we read the next few verses in Deuteronomy, um, we get even more detail about this period. So verse 65. And among these nations shalt thou find no ease, neither shall the sole of thy foot have rest. But the Lord shall give thee there a trembling heart and failing of eyes and sorrow of mind. And thy life shall hang in doubt before thee. And thou shalt fear day and night and shalt have none assurance of thy life. In the morning thou wouldst... Sorry. In the morning thou shalt say, would God it were even, and at even thou shalt say, would God it were morning, for the fear of thine heart wherewith thou shalt fear, and for the sight of thine eyes which thou shalt see. And so again they were told that they'd find no rest in the nations that they were scattered to, that they would live in fear in day, both day and night. And um, we know how badly they were persecuted during the days of Nazi Germany. Um, and we see now, um, due to the conflict uh, with Hamas, um, the, the increasing anti-Semitism um, across the world. Uh, but if you'll come with me, please, to Isaiah 41. Um, it would have been fair to think that after the scattering of the Jews, after their persecution, after nearly 2,000 years out of their homeland, that the nation of Israel um, and the Jews would cease to exist. Um, after all, we've had a couple of examples that Babylon and Tyre were um, extremely powerful nations in their day, and yet they, as nations, don't exist anymore. But Israel had been told by God that they are still God's chosen people, um, despite um, them not worshipping him in the way that they should. And we're told in Isaiah chapter 41, verse 8, But thou, Israel, art my servant, Jacob, whom I have chosen, the seed of Abraham, my friend, thou whom I have taken from the ends of the earth, and called thee from the chief men thereof, and said unto thee, Thou art my servant, I have chosen thee, and not cast thee away. Um, and then if you'll come over a couple of chapters to chapter 43, uh, we read in verse 10, Ye are my witnesses, saith the Lord, and my servant whom I have chosen, that ye may know and believe, and understand that I am he. Before me there was no God formed, neither shall there be after me. And so God tells us that the people of Israel are his witnesses. Um, the existence of the, the nation of Israel is proof um, of God's existence, um, because there are so many events we've, we could look at uh, throughout history, um, which um, should have destroyed them as a nation. And if you'll come with me uh, forward a couple of books to Ezekiel 34, um, we're seeing throughout history that God protects um, the people of Israel because they are his chosen people, um, despite them uh, being scattered across the world nearly 2,000 years. They, they still, 2,000 years ago, they still exist as a nation. And um, we read in Ezekiel 34, verse 13, uh, that God says, I will bring them out from the people and gather them from the countries. I will bring them to their own land and feed them upon the mountains of Israel by the rivers and in all the inhabited places of the country. Um, so they were told that they would be gathered again um, to their own land. And it continues, um, if we come over a few chapters to chapter 37, verse 14. Um, God tells them, verse 14, that and sh I shall put my spirit in you, and ye shall live, and I shall place you in your own land, then ye shall know that I, the Lord, have spoken it and performed it, saith the Lord. So they are told that once again they would come into their own land. Um, and we know that many different places were suggested for the Jews to settle um, and be, to make their nation again, in, including uh, land in Africa. Um, but in 1948, the, the state of Israel was established back in their own land. 
Um, and if you have a bit of time, uh, look at um, how this came about because um, it's an extremely um, interesting um, turn of events. But despite continual persecution and opposition, um, this prophecy once again came true. So there were other examples we could use within scripture um, of, uh, of prophecies that have, have come true. Um, but how does this benefit us? How does um, seeing these prophecies come true, why is it of value to us? Um, well, we started the talk at the beginning thinking about fear. And the one thing that people generally fear the most within the world is death. Uh, we mentioned war, um, disease, disease, hunger, uh, right at the start. All of these things uh, lead to death, and um, it's one thing that we we cannot escape from, can we? Um, but is there a solution to this? Um, is there any solution um, that can be given um, to escape this eventuality that would lead to eternal life? Um, well, if you come with me to Romans and chapter 6, uh, because there there are prophecies within the Bible that haven't been fulfilled yet. Um, and those prophecies can include us as well. Um, if we um, believe in um, the Lord Jesus Christ and his Father, um, our God. So Romans chapter 6, verse 3. We read, Know ye not that so many of us as were baptized into Jesus Christ were baptized into his death? Therefore we are buried with him by baptism into death, that like as Christ was raised up from the dead by the glory of the Father, even so we also should walk in newness of life. And so the Bible tells us that those who believe in Jesus, those who are baptised, um, will be raised again um, in newness of life. And this um, this life we're, we're talking about, um, it won't be um, given an, another hundred years if we're found to be faithful. The Bible tells us that this will be a, an everlasting life um, on earth um, with um, in Jesus' kingdom. Those who are still alive on the earth uh, when this resurrection happens um, and those who also have um, who's fallen on, on sleep, as we call it, fallen on, on death. Uh, will be raised again if they've been faithful and um, to be part of uh, this this kingdom an everlasting life so when will this happen uh, we're not told exactly um, but um, in acts chapter 1 and verse 11 uh, jesus's disciples they're told by an angel as he ascended up into heaven ye men of galilee why stand ye gazing up into heaven this same jesus which is taken up from you into heaven shall so come in like manner as ye have seen him go into heaven. And so we're told that um, Jesus will return to the earth um, to establish this kingdom. Um, and again, no need to turn there, but Isaiah 9 verse 7 um, tells us of, of this kingdom, of the increase of his government and peace there shall be no end. Upon the throne of David and upon his kingdom, to order it and to establish it with judgment and with justice from henceforth, even forever, the zeal of the Lord of hosts will perform this. So we're told that Jesus will return to the earth to establish a kingdom uh, which will last forever. And we're not told the exact dates when Jesus will return, but through prophecy, we're um, given signs to look out for. Um, which tell us that the return of Jesus is imminent. Um, it could be later today, um, as we're not told uh, when exactly it will be. So we might fear uh, what's going on um, in our own lives or, or in the, the world um, at the moment. But if we trust in the Bible and we're told that it can lead to happiness, to eternal life, um, because Jesus will soon be back in the earth to set up his kingdom where there will be no war. There'll be no disease or hunger. Um, there'll be no reason to fear anymore. We will be able to live a life in peace forever um, because um, death will be taken away. And so we, we can trust in the Bible, um, but it's up to you whether you want to put your trust in God's word or not. Thank you for listening.